Thank you all for coming to our joint men's and women's Bible study. We will be studying my beloved topic of apologetics. This subject, this line of study is particularly near and dear to my heart because it was integral to my coming to faith. Um, we will talk about it more throughout the study, I'm sure, but the book by Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, um, was instrumental in my uh, Christian formation and, and my conversion to faith. So um, since then, since that time, I have uh, pursued a study of apologetics in a number of ways and roped a number of my family members into that pursuit of apologetics. Um, I've taken, uh, I've not completed a seminary degree, but I've taken a number of seminary classes, one of which was an intensive study into apologetics. And since then, I've been able to attend a number of apologetic conferences where uh, some of the uh, most, many of the authors that we will be referencing and quoting uh, throughout this study, um, who are leaders in the world field of apologetics, are frequent speakers. And so I've been able to um, engage with them directly at these conferences, and um, it has continued to be a uh, rewarding and rich area of spiritual growth in my life and an area of inspiration for us to be able to share um, faith with this congregation as well. So with that, I um, wanted to welcome you all here again. We do have uh, PowerPoint slides in the presentation. We've printed them out um, with uh, areas for notes. It's three per page with areas for notes. For those who need a uh, larger print, I think that we can PDF those and email those. I'm talking to you, Harvey. Um, so we will do that in advance when I remember, because I just remember just now, and I will remember to do that better in the future, because we were preparing this last night. Um, and so do you, before we get started, um, any questions um, before Heather comes up and we launch into our, our study? Okay. You coming up here? I can't see past the lights. I got to unmute myself here. And Usually I'm on the wow, other side of the lights, uh, and I don't appreciate exactly how blinding they are. But they, <laughs> they really are remarkably bright. Okay. So I'm gonna this, double check. this week one, we're expecting this study to run approximately 13 weeks. We will, of course, be uh, not meeting and breaking um, on a couple of Thursdays corresponding to uh, holidays. Um, so... Uh, this should take us right up to before Christmas. Is that correct? I think that's about right. That's about right. Uh, and just so that you guys know, okay, I'm going to come ahead and come in. Okay. No, I want to be on this side. You want to be on that side? Yeah. Because you like to draw? Yeah. Okay. But I need to. Yeah. But you need what? Uh, my mic. Okay. Hey there. Okay. So um, right back on one of those tables are some extra, uh, right back there are some extra. Um, Printouts, if you would like those, um, and uh, we can always make more, and people can share, and whatever. Um, but go ahead, and everybody, let's uh, start to get get into it. Um, I'd like to open us in prayer, yeah. uh, and then we can sort of get going. Uh, go ahead. Okay, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the guidance that you give to us. Lord, we appreciate being able to come here together as a family of believers to engage in your word, Lord, to know what it is to share uh, with those around us in a way that draws them closer to you, Lord, draws them to just the incredible uh, sacrifice of Christ, the love of the Father, and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that as we go through these next several weeks that you would open our minds and our hearts to what you have in store for us and how you want us to go out into the world to share your message. We love you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we are, just so everybody knows, we are recording this. Yes. Okay. Um, Denise, would you grab some and maybe to make a couple more copies? Thank you. Um, so just so everybody knows, we are going to be recording these sessions just like we did for uh, Revelation because it's very normal. You can't make every single Thursday night. Um, would love you to be here every single Thursday night, but just in case you can't, um, we are recording these. We will put them up on YouTube under a playlist of apologetics, um, so you will be able to watch it even if you happen to miss a week. 
Um, and uh, let's see, what else? Uh, anything else that I'm missing in terms of kind of housekeeping stuff? We're going to uh, we're gonna start right at or right as close to 6 o'clock as we can possibly can. We're going to try to run for about 90 minutes and then have 15 minutes for uh, questions and then time for prayer and prayer requests and, and all of that. So we're going to try to make sure that we keep it just a little bit um, less overwhelming and, uh, and keep it to about 90 minutes. So um, you ready? Ready. Okay. So we wanted to actually start out with a couple of introductory questions. Um, so this is audience participation time, so please feel free to uh, shout out your answers. The first question is this, what do you think apologetics is? Defending the faith, okay. I have no clue, okay. That's all right, that's why we're here. <laughs> Christopher, control your pen. Uh, anybody else? I, defending the faith, what was the second thing? That was it. Oh, I'm the sorry, there was a second one. Okay, I, I interrupted. Okay, you used to think apologetics was what? Like you had to apologize. Yes, it sounds like it, doesn't it? Absolutely. Why you believe what you believe, okay. Anybody else? Okay. How do you feel, I mean, you're all here, so hopefully you're all wanting to be here, but how do you feel about the topic of apologetics? And there's a reason that I ask this, and you're going to probably be in one of three camps. One camp is, I don't see the purpose of it. Uh, the second camp is, I'm really excited for it, and I cannot wait. And the third camp is, uh, I know it's important, but um, it's a little bit intimidating. So, third one, okay. Two. Super excited, over there, love it. Two, we got lots of twos. Um, we have some more uh, printouts if anybody needs them, just let uh, Denise know and she'll hand one out for you. Um, anybody else? Are you in the, uh, the camp of uh, no thank you, uh, I'm super excited, or I'm a bit intimidated? Sweet. Sweet. So somebody who's never even heard of apologetics before, totally okay. Um, up until, I don't know, maybe a dozen years or so ago, um, apologetics was not something I really knew much about. Um, and so it, I think that's pretty, pretty normal, pretty natural that it's something that gets talked about. And sometimes it's sort of glossed over at times, um, and we don't really get into the meat of it. Anybody else? Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm hmm. Sure. So I yeah. don't want to put words in your mouth, but one of the things that we're going to look at in about five slides. Is the word apologetics is irrelevant to you? Does that it can encapsulate what you're thinking? You're like, I don't get the big deal. Why? Why apologetics? Why do we have to defend the faith? He's real. What's the big deal? Uh huh. Well, and that's really interesting because that's starting from a, a very specific point, mm -hmm. and that is a part of apologetics. Absolutely, one of the pillars. It's, it's one, of the, one pillars. of the pillars of yeah. apologetics. So, so you got not, one. It's not Good. wrong. It's just a different <laughs> leg of it. Cheryl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we are actually, uh, so uh, unapologetically and apologetics are two different things, or yeah. apology and apologetics. However, you, you keyed in on a really important point, um, and that is that um, there are people, uh, and we're going to get into it, we have even some visuals here, um, about what it means to uh, bash somebody over the head with your faith. Okay. 
Um, so next question, what are you hoping to get out of this class? Oh, love it. Strength to be able to speak to people. Should have got a bigger whiteboard. <laughs> The right words, okay. Strength to be able to speak, speak to people, the right words. What else? What's that? Confidence? Yeah, Sean. Oh, love it. Yes. Yeah, answers to some of the toughest questions, uh, especially in this day and age. We get some really difficult questions to answer. And it would be really easy for us to just point to scripture. But uh, you got to remember that sometimes you're talking to somebody who has no scriptural basis. And so how do you answer those questions without going, see, this is what it says in the Bible. Anybody else? Absolutely. Fellowship and learning is vital. We are called not to neglect meeting with one another, right? because we are to sharpen each other. Yeah, uh, that's that's absolutely. Um, it, it's a it's a very standard place for us to be at because when people ask us, especially other adults, um, more especially even our children, as adults, um, when they have drifted away from um, our faith, that we have um, tried to help instill in them, it um, it can be really difficult to answer those questions that they're hearing from the rest of the world. Absolutely. Uh, anybody else on what you're hoping to get out of this class? Okay. So the one thing that I would add, because it's the one thing that I found that I wasn't, I didn't know I was looking for, is in studying apologetics, I have found incredible inspiration and encouragement for my own faith, both faith applied as well as answers to uh, the basic questions um, that are, that un underpin our faith. And all of that um, I found to be encouraging and restoring and inspiring in a way that I hadn't expected. So, and we'll share some of those stories over the, over the sessions, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so now that we've kind of had a little bit of an opening, what you're hoping to get from this class, we're going to start digging into a little bit of this. And I want to start this week uh, and really talk about the fact that what is apologetics? That's really what week one is about. And then we'll start to get into and dig into some of those uh, big questions, uh, the way to defend the faith, the way to share your faith uh, in a way that connects people to, to Christ and uh, what he did for each and every person who chooses him. Um, and so uh, it, it's really interesting because uh, Christopher and I have a little bit of a... a, a I know it's not going to be a shocker to any of you, but we have a little bit of a different approach to things. Um, and Christopher very much falls into this first camp of the traditional definition of apologetics. And people ask me this, and it just rolls off the tongue. I mm -hmm. say this to people. I say, is the systematic, rational, logical defense of the faith? <laughs> Boom. And people go, oh, what now? Those say words again? themselves don't necessarily mean a whole lot when you string them together. And so it really bears unpacking each of those pieces because really that that's that's the nice short we have a saying in our family christopher doesn't use three words where 10 will do well this is one of the shortest sentences i've ever put <laughs> together okay and it's too short it's too concise and it's because there's too much packed into that yeah. and so we're going to unpack all of those things okay so let's uh let's talk about what that uh, rational, logical defense of the faith really means and where it's grounded biblically. Because we are here, we are in a church, we want to make sure everything that we are doing is aligned with what the Bible tells us. So uh, this one is 1 Peter 3.15. Which is really considered to be the anchor verse for all of apologetics. All of apologetics um, is, is inspired 
um, and, and goes back to this very simple instruction from Peter where he says, um, and if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm reading from the L NLT. What yeah, do we this, have? this one the is ESV. the ESV. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So there's, there's a, a word that I've highlighted in here. Um, and it's defense. It's actually the, the first thing that somebody uh, shouted out when we asked, what is apologetics? And that was defending the faith. And it's because this word defense is, is originally a Greek word, apologia. And so that word apologia is how we get the term apologetics. So it's not an apology, even though that's kind of what it sounds like in, e in, in English, the original Greek translation uh, or the original Greek was apologia. And that meant a defense as in a courtroom. So oftentimes what this meant was um, that, the, that the apostles were actually having to defend their faith and those who followed the way were having to defend their faith even to the point of doing so in a courtroom. And so when Peter is encouraging those who he is speaking to, he's telling them, be ready because you are going to have to defend what you believe and why you believe it. And so that's how we get the uh, term apologetics. It comes from that Greek word apologia, and that means defense as in a courtroom. Anything you want to add to that? Yes, so that's why when I give my short little uh, sentence definition of what apologetics is, as I said, it's the systematic, logical, rational, rational defense of the faith, okay? So if you go into the courtroom in order to defend a criminal case, for example, you want to be systematic. If there is evidence that helps build your case, you want to include it. You want to build layer upon layer upon layer of ironclad evidence that builds an airtight case that shows that you've got everything covered. Logical. It needs to be intelligible. People need to understand what you've done. It needs to make logical sense. The pieces need to comport with reality. Okay, it needs to be uh, 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 stand up against objection. It needs to be able to be st uh, withstand being picked apart from from the opposition. Right? It's logical, rational. You're using reason. You're drawing conclusions that a rational person would make. Right? And all of that together is the composite case that you put together in order to prove and win as in a court of law being judged by people who are thinking critically about what you are presenting. So when I say it's a systematic, logical, rational defense of the faith, that's a whole lot of words that when you unpack them, what do you get? You get a Greek apologia, which is a courtroom defense of the faith. And you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to put together this big presentation. You have to go in and talk for three days. It's possible to do an apologetic defense in 30 seconds or three minutes or 10 minutes, depending on what question it is that you're being asked and who you're talking to. But the point is that whatever we're doing with apologetics is always going to feed into one of those pieces that would be part of your defense that you would present in a courtroom. It doesn't have to be all at once, but they are all part of that package that goes into why we believe what we believe, which I erased it, but that's what someone said, why yeah. we believe what we believe. Yeah, and, and the, other, the other piece to this is, um, is that Christopher said, you know, that could be done in 30 seconds or three minutes or, or, or 10 minutes. It can also be done in 10 years. Uh, because this is something that you may be having these conversations with somebody over a significant course of time before that actually connects for them. Uh, and, and the point of it is you're not leaving them anywhere along the way. You're continuing to bring forward that systematic, logical, rational defense of the faith. 
Now, that's the way Christopher connects to, um, to apologetics. And Christopher's very scientific mind really likes all of those individual pieces and making sure that uh, it systematically, logically, and rationally goes together. And that is important, and we're always going to make sure that we do that. But I want to give you a slightly different def definition, which is a little bit more of a practical definition um, for kind of what we're going to do over the next uh, 12 or so weeks. This is the practical de definition for apologetics as it is today is an attempt to remove obstacles or doubts. So that's the first piece. It's an attempt to remove obstacles or doubts and offer positive reasons for believing that Christianity is true and satisfying. And those two words are, are highly critical. They're really important because there are a lot of people who say, oh yeah, I, I believe that Jesus came. And, and I believe, I, I, there are people who even believe that um, Jesus died for their sins. However, they don't believe Christianity is satisfying. It, it, it's something where you're going to have to give up so much of what you value if you want to follow Christ as Lord. Uh, and, and that's where part of apologetics comes in, is as you dig more and more and more into this topic, uh, it, it helps unlock those doors for us so that we are the ones who are fully committed to Christ in order to help others become fully committed to Christ. We've got to make this font bigger. We've got to make this font bigger. I know. I, and I look over there, and I can't read that with the lights on, so um, I'm having to turn around. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, what we will also do is, is have a large PDF version of this, and um, we'll ha make sure that it's linked from the... Um, from the website uh, where we're hosting the, the videos. So um, apologies for that on my screen at home. It looks just fine. Um, okay, so I, I actually want to pull out here another area that is very biblical. This comes from Matthew 22, verse 37. And it sa this is the great commanded commandment. Um, this is where the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, uh, what is the greatest commandment throughout all the, the law and the, the prophets? And Jesus comes back and says, this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And that's really important. Now, the second piece of that is, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? Uh, and all of everything flows out of those two commandments. But the reason this is, so, this is so important, and the reason I have highlighted in here heart, soul, and mind is because there are really um, three prongs of apologetics. Um, some books call it three prophets of apologetics. Some call it three pillars or foundations of apologetics. Um, and it really comes down to these three areas, your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the first one is your mind. And that is your reasoning. And everybody, as a, as a human, we long for the truth. We long for the truth. We really want to know what the truth is. And for it to make sense. And for it to make sense. And, and um, there's a lot of, uh, I, I'm not sure we're going to unpack this, but if you ever want to have this conversation, we can. Um, there are a lot of different um, characteristics of what makes a worldview valid, mm -hmm. um, in, including that it needs to be cohesive, it needs to be logical, it can't, you know, um, on an ad hoc basis change itself or change its foundational tenets and, and that kind of thing. So um, this is where you're engaging your mind in order to examine and understand truth. And one of the things that we're going to do over the course of this time is, is confirm for ourselves why Christianity is true. So that's your mind. The second piece of it is your conscience or your soul. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul. Your soul is your conscience. And that's where we're longing for goodness. And justice. And justice. Um, Christopher has a, a really, really uh, deep sense of righteous indignation. And it really stems from a root of desiring justice for the world. And you'll actually see a lot of people today, and they desire to do good. 
They really want to make the world a better place, which is great news for us as Christians because it's a place where we can meet those people. It's a place where we can interact with them, and it's a place where we can share our faith in a way that is gentle and respectful. And it's a common ground that we have as humans, and all three of these things are common ground that we all have as humans. So we all have that innate desire. You can see it from little children, right? Um, they <laughs> they're the one that did it. Um, I need you to go talk to them, make it better, fix it, because there's a sense of injustice, right? Um, now, we have our own sense of justice, which may or may not align with God's sense of justice. Uh, so that's where we need to be a little bit careful, but we all have that sense of justice or that sense of desiring goodness. And, and actually, this is where, at, at, you know, as we go through, we're going to attack this particular question. Um, how can Christianity be true if there is evil in the world, if the world isn't good? If God is a good God, how could there be evil? And we will get to that, and it really comes down to this question. We're longing for goodness and justice. And you see this really significantly in the younger generations mm -hmm. where they are living completely atheistic lives without any kind of faith or, or systematic um, uh, religion or spirituality. And yet, where do we meet them? We meet them out in the world serving in order to make a difference. They're trying to save the environment. They're trying to save the whales. They're trying to save something. They're trying for to, to, to reconcile that justice and, 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 and win that justice because they believe that it is a priority in their hearts, but it is like an island without any context in the, in the world. Their, their, their efforts, because it's not grounded in anything other than their human nature wanting to make a positive difference in the world. And so it's interesting because Christian missionaries are meeting other people serving in the fields in the world, and they're complete atheists. And they're like, I'm, you know, I'm here to save the world. Why are you here? I'm like, I hear, I'm here because I'm, I'm, I'm serving Jesus Christ. And they're like, really? That doesn't make any sense to me. Let's go dig a well. And so uh, we're meeting the next generation of potential faithful followers of Christ in the mission field because mm -hmm. they're already working. They just don't know why. Ab absolutely, but there, there's that deep-seated conscience inside of them, that soul. And then the third piece of this is imagination. Um, and, and oftentimes, uh, that's what I would call your heart, your imagination, that longing for beauty. And, and there, are, there are people who fall into um, one of these three camps in, more, in, in a higher way than another. Um, people who are really in touch with their heart and that longing for beauty, that, that imagination, um, they want to see uh, things that are, that are beautiful and it, it expresses itself through art and music and literature. But it's always with this desire to see, um, see beauty in the world. Or there's those who are really mind driven and they really want to see truth or those who are very uh, justice-driven, heart-driven, and uh, they want to see goodness in this world. And so there's, there's an understanding uh, that I want everybody to take away for yourself. Where are you in this grouping? And, um, and where are those around you in this grouping? And here's, here's why. Um, somebody who is, is in that imagination camp, Christopher may not really connect to that person well because he's in the mind camp. But me, being an imagination person, uh, I might connect to that person uh, even more because the I'm in that, in that desire for art and beauty and literature and, and that expression of creativity that you find from God. Uh, so it, it's really important, just think about that. Which of these camps are you in? And um, as we go along, you'll start to see a pattern here of, where are where is this other person that you're defending your faith to or sharing your faith with or leading to the gospel? So this is dangerous because I think I just added a new word to my definition. <laughs> I think we got to add the word comprehensive, mm. okay? 
Why? Because I tend to focus on one of the pillars. We're about to introduce you to the pillars of apologetics. And I tend to focus on one of them because it's the one that speaks to me. But in order to speak to the whole person and to all people, all people who have been created by God, there needs to be aspects from all of the pillars in order to truly reach all people because um, different people will have different areas that speak to them personally. And so in order to be a truly effective, good apologist, in order to reach people, you need to be able to speak all of those languages. Mm -hmm. In the words of Paul, I became all things to all people that yep. I might reach some for the glory of Christ. Yes, yes. Um, and and it, uh, apologetics is really a multidisciplinary field. And, and that's really what we're unpacking here right now is that it's not just one thing. And so that, that I think is important why we asked, it, asked the question at the beginning, what do you think apologetics is? Because it's more than just defense and it's more than just why do we believe and it's more than just how do you lead somebody to uh, a saving faith. Um, it's all of those things. It's, it's comprehensive. You wanna take this one or you wanna start with this one? Um, these are, there are apolog apologetic objections or barriers to apologetics. And we're going to take a look at it both from the side of the believer and from the side of the non-believer. Um, and I'll, I'll take the believer and you take the non-believer because that's sort of where you came from. Um, and, I, and I think that's a really good uh, division here. The first one, uh, the objection to apologetics by the believer is it feels too much like head over heart. Meaning um, we connect to God through our emotions. Um, we experience him deeply. Why do we got to get so uh, analytical. analytical, intellectual, um, academic, all of those things? So um, that's, that's one of the objections from a believer's standpoint is, is it's just too much head, not enough heart. And that's, that's actually actually not true of apologetics at all, though it can be depending on how you're delivering it. Um, too intellectual or irrelevant. Um, so one of the things Christopher talked about just a little bit ago was that um, it can feel irrelevant. Uh, and, and the reason it can feel intellectual or irrelevant is, is again, that emotional connection that we have. Um, and if we get too... If we get too heady with it, if we get too intellectual with it, um, aren't we just being philosophical as opposed to emotional? And, and so really wanted to bring in Romans 12, 2, because I think this helps to really sum it up. And, and this is sort of the, um, the answer or the um, uh, refutation of this as an objection. Well, hey, it's, you know, apologetics is, is too intellectual for being part of the faith. And in Romans 12, too, uh, you know, it's a reminder that we are, rem that we are reminded, that sentence didn't make any sense, it's, it's <laughs> an instruction that we are reminded um, where we are to be transformed. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Some translations say, by the renewing of your mind, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So ultimately, how do you renew your mind? How do you change your mind? You learn, you dig, you explore, you, you investigate, you expand, you encourage, you, you bring in. And, and if you're not doing those things, how is your mind being changed? Now, there's always going to be some change that happens when people accept Christ. Um, but to tr true transformation happens um, when you really expand and dig into um, your faith in a, in a much more profound way. Um, man's reason is corrupted by sin. This is really an, an interesting one. There are those who will, on the believer's side, say, um, because we are sinful by nature, we cannot possibly be able to fully um, understand and comprehend God. Therefore, how can we express and, and, and share with others um, everything effectively about who God is because we don't understand it ourselves. Well, that's true. We don't understand everything, but we do have a very intellectual understanding of who God is and emotional connection with who God is and a, um, a spirit-led 
uh, conscience based on um, the Holy Spirit that's within us. So we do have some of these answers. Um, we just don't have all of them, and that's okay. And that there is a... Um, there, there is a, a camp of believers that say apologetics is simply unbiblical. And here's why. And, and the reason we're sharing this even is, is because um, it's important for us to know why we're taking this class and, and why, we're, why we're engaging in this material. And because you might hear somebody say, well, that's not biblical because it's the job of the Holy Spirit to change people's hearts. It's not your job. It's, it's the not job your of the job. Holy Spirit to draw the, draw believers closer mm -hmm. to him, right? And which is not untrue. That's that's sort of a, a yes and, right? Yeah. That's that's a truth and because yes, it is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to uh, help change the heart of the the uh, somebody that you're talking to. But how can the Holy Spirit do that without somebody partnering in this plane, in this existence? God's chosen vessels to do that, to carry that message, is humanity. Mm -hmm. It's his followers. It's his believers. So really, it's the job of the Holy Spirit to use what we say, do, and, and the way that we partner with God in order to help people come to a saving faith in Christ. Um, there are those who think that you should only quote scripture. Um, and what I mean... Sola scripture. <laughs> what I mean by that is um, this is what it says in the Bible and therefore it says it in the Bible and therefore you should believe it because it's in the Bible. Well, what about people who don't the actually <laughs> think the Bible is real? When you come at them with scripture after scripture after scripture, how is that helpful to them? Yeah, they say you're just quoting your cult book. That doesn't mean anything. So we really need to know that while Scripture is our uh, basis, it's not our weapon. Ooh, I just came up with that one. That was pretty good. <laughs> That'll preach. <laughs> um, and that, that when we do this, it, it puts, puts the, um, the job in man's hands instead of God's. Like we're taking God's job away from him. Um, and, and yeah, that there is a, an element in that it is man, humans, talking to other humans, sharing human faith and human truth and human logic and human rationality. And, and, um, and, and yet to believe that we are in control of that um, fully and completely, as in God's not a part of it. That's just arrogant. So it's, it's, it's really important to understand that um, you may get that from somebody, that it's unbiblical, but these are, these are all of the reasons why um, I believe that's not the case. Okay, so now we're going to switch to the non-believer. And um, I don't know if you wanted to do just a real quick... Uh, 2.42, we've got time. we got time. Kay. Go ahead. So a uh, little bit... Um, since you guys understand where I'm coming from on this one, um, I was, when I was growing up, um, I was raised in a church environment, and I was in Sunday school. I actually remember the conversation. I think I remember the church, and I think I remember about how old I was, but I was in a Sunday school class, um, and I want to say I was somewhere between the ages of, you know, eight and ten, and um, there was... Very grown up. Yeah, very grown up. And there was a, a storyteller with a, with a volunteer on Sunday, someone teaching Sunday school, and they had their little felt board, and they were teaching a story about something or another. And I asked a question, and I've been known for a long time for my difficult questions, yes? And this su poor Sunday school teacher, volunteer, uh, made the mistake of telling me, well, it's not your job to question, it's your job to believe. And I was out. I was out. That was the minute that I pulled chocks and was done with faith. And um, I found ways to avoid going to church and avoid um, you know, 
being around those hypocritical churchy people. I was also learning things about world history and uh, all of the atrocities uh, that had been committed in the name of organized religions. We're not even going to point fingers because they're all guilty at one point. And I, I, there was this massive hypocrisy, and I was just done. And you know, I thought I was so smart for being so cynical and seeing through all this truth. And I carried that as a chip on my shoulder into my 20s and found ways to avoid the church. And so I was a pretty jerk of an atheist um, all the way through most of my education. And um, it was um, when I was mar already married to Heather. I mean, we our, our wedding was incredibly secular. It was beautiful, and it was honoring, and you know, it was um, a, a, a lovely family event, but God was completely absent from our wedding, even though it was held in a, in a church. And um, it was later when we were starting to get into, into our lives and, and experience true hardship and experience true struggles and issues that lead to um, you know, sp spiritual existential problems that I started to seek a little bit more um, spiritual meaning. And that was the beginning of my journey to, to faith. And one of the things I said to Heather is, you know, I just, the thing that I can't get past is this blind faith that, that that Christians have. She goes, wait a minute, can you unpack that for me a little bit? So I told her my story about the nine-year-old, you know, Sunday school being told, your job is not the question, your job, job is to just believe. And she said, that, that was absolutely not my experience as a Christian child growing up. We were taught that you need to be able to ask and answer the difficult questions in order to truly understand and have a vibrant faith. And I went, huh. I don't know anything about that. And suddenly I wanted to know. I wanted to know. So that was the beginning of my um, journey towards faith, God pulling me towards himself. And uh, from about 2003 to about 2007, um, that was a growing process of me go turning from a jerk of an atheist um, into a uh, believer and follower of Christ. So when we say objections by the non believer, um, these, w these were the arrows in my quiver, and I love shooting people with them, okay? So th these objections are some of my favorites. Go ahead. Yeah, hammer me with them. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you know what you were, yours were, but the first one is defeater beliefs. We had a question. Oh, yeah. And I don't want to scare people. That's, that's an excellent point. And I don't want to scare people. But we, when we um, take on the mantle of teaching, whether it's teaching children or teaching from the stage or teaching around the coffee shop with friends, um, there is a huge responsibility um, to representing God and Christ accurately and well. And so that's why we frequently pray, you know, God, please do not let my failing humanity shine through, but let Christ shine through me. I don't have the words. I don't have the answers, but please, Holy Spirit, fill me with the words and the answer to be able to, 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 to um, give this person the answer that they need to hear, not what I think they need to hear. And so that's why we pray that prayer and mean it when we do. There have been times when I did not have the answer. I was like, oh God, I have no idea what to say. And then I said something brilliant and it wasn't me. Like I said, I said stuff that I had never made those connections before. And I go back and like, wow, that was good. Where was that from? That is trusting the Holy Spirit to do it. But you also have to do the groundwork to equip yourself with the knowledge to be able to put that together when, when people need to hear it. So yes, t teaching is a huge responsibility. And I don't want to scare people with that. But instead, as you said, and thank you for the way you put it, isn't that a, a inspiration for people to go and tr learn about their faith so that they can express it, explain it, and defend it appropriately, whether it's to a small child or to an adult or to a friend or to a family member or to a total stranger. Yes, absolutely. And it's one of the reasons that I'm so enthusiastic about apologetics. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's talk about what defeater beliefs S are. So defeater beliefs are a, a category, and they're different throughout the world. But a defeater belief is anything that is held as um, 
a, a, a fundamental truth in someone's mind. A lot of times it's not even conscious. A lot of times it'll be some idea that has been injected into their mind because of their culture or their context. But it's one of those things that allows them to just write off and negate an entire belief system because of one thing, one box that it doesn't check or one box that's wrong that it does check. So for me, for example, a defeater be belief is all Christians are hypocrites because of the Crusades. Invalid, irrelevant, and, and therefore anything that Christianity has to say to me forever, I can completely disregard. That is an example of a defeater belief that I held um, in, in my atheism. Um, what, what was... Uh, so an another big one that, that you hear today is that all religions are equal. Yeah, which is a, a definite most uh, postmodern postmodernist view that um, all religions are valid, all religions are equal, and all, all religions lead to salvation and God in heaven. Um, those are ones that are common to us. But I said there's defeater beliefs in other parts mm -hmm. of the world, and some, some of these, uh, they don't even make sense to us, but uh, one of the examples that is a defeater belief against Christianity in the Far East and the Middle East is that everyone in the West believes the gospel. Everyone in the West is a Christian. Everyone in the West is a Christian, right? Now, how could that possibly be a defeater belief? Well, how could those people who believe that possibly do these awful things, right? So it's, it, that, that gets down to the problem of evil. How, how can good believers do awful things? Not everybody is a good believer, right? So, and good people do bad things sometimes. So, so um while we're just on this topic, is there anything that you have heard from somebody that kind of falls into this camp of a defeater belief? Mm hmm Yeah. If there's so much evil in the world, how can Christianity be true? That's a huge one, and, and we're going to spend a whole week on that. Mm -hmm. So, ultimately, Christianity is supposed to be love, right? And they express hate, which means hypocrisy. But they, well, they call themselves Christian, and they, they may actually be Christians. That, it's not to say that they aren't Christians. It's just to say that they are not engaging in Christianity in a way that is biblically supported. We would call that bad Christians. So, so let me challenge you and push back on that. A and this is especially um, for those who didn't grow up Christian. When you first became a Christian, were you a perfect Christian? Were you kind and loving to all people around you? Are you still a Christian? Not necessarily, but can you still be a Christian? Absolutely, and I will absolutely concede that point. Um, and, and taking, you know, hate to the, the point of, of genocide. That, that was not a, a Christian person. It was somebody who claimed Christianity. Absolutely. But can you... And, and I'm, I, I'm trying to make this distinction very, very clear. Can you um, alienate somebody who has a different belief than you and treat them poorly and yet still be a Christian? Because at that point in your Christian walk, you just don't know better. Mm -hmm. Amen to that, yeah. Yeah. 
Texas, many, most of you, many of you have heard me say this, and you're about to un understand, because of Tina's wonderful question, um, where this phrase comes from. Um, because I mean it very sincerely, and I don't mean for it to be glib, I don't mean for it to be trite, and I don't mean for it to be an excuse. But you've heard me say, better today than we were yesterday, and we strive to be better tomorrow than we were today. Christ does not demand perfection, but he expects progress, okay? Progress over perfection. So mm -hmm. the goal, and what is biblical, is that the true Christian is in earnest pursuit of transforming themselves more and more into the likeness of Christ. And so as long as that pursuit is making progress, God honors that as a Christian, right? And that's why it was called followers of the way. It was followers of the way of Jesus Christ. They didn't call them Christians. They called them followers. It's almost like, you know, doctors in a practice. Why are the doctors always practicing, right? Because are they ever going to get it right? Christians are never going to get it all right. You don't have to get it all right. But where's your heart? Is your heart pursuing Christ so that you are ever being transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. Th and this is, this is absolutely an ongoing journey that continues in each of our lives. Um, I've shared our, our sermon from a couple of, of weeks ago about um, uh, missions and outreach. Okay, there was a time when I as a Christian went, there's no way I want to go uh, into a third world, dirty, disease-ridden, impoverished, hungry uh, uh, barrio uh, slum and help people. I don't want to do that. They should help themselves. I, you know, there's their righteous indignation, right? Why should I have to leave the comfort, comfort, safety, and security of my home and my country and my state and my neighborhood in order to go help someone else? And God went, did you hear what you just asked? <laughs> because that's what Christ did. And so there was, there was a time in my walk and my Christianity where I went, Jesus really did spend his time with the prostitutes and with the sinners and with the poor and, and with the criminals and with the hypocrites and with the soldiers and with the oppressors and with the dictators. All the people we love to hate. That's who Christ was working for. And if we are going to become more and more like Christ, those people have to become our priority. Our priorities have to be transformed and changed. Doesn't happen overnight. Doesn't happen overnight. He doesn't expect perfection. He expects progress. So to the answer to your question is, are those people truly Christians? The answer is, God only knows. Okay? But if you look at the arc of their lives, if you look at the arc of their lives, you will see them growing more and more in their faith, maturing as Christians, becoming more and more Christ-like, becoming more and more like what you would expect someone who is steeped in the Bible and is um, intentionally modeling Christ's priorities, Christ's behaviors, Christ's words throughout their life, in every aspect of their life. That's a Christian. So you, at any given time, there's going to be ups and downs, right? Any, uh, I'm getting into my graphs again. Okay, there's at, at any given point over someone's life, right, there's going to be times when they're more like Christ and less like Christ, and then more like Christ and less like Christ. But what you're seeing over the life of the true Christian in these peaks and valleys is that there's an overall trajectory upwarding more and more Christ-likeness, more and more faithfulness, more and more transformation of their personality, and that's how you know that someone is truly pursuing Christ. Are they going to be perfect at it every day? No, there's going to be loads. There's going to be days when you're, you're I was going to start giving you specific examples, but it doesn't matter. When you have had tragedy in your life that makes it very difficult to get out of your own context and actually put on the skin of Christ and deal with the world. There's going to be days when you just can't do it. But as you practice this more and more over the course of your life, you get better at it, and it becomes notable to the people around you. So, so let me um, let me bring that that home just real quickly, um, it, because I, I I do want to make a distinction, uh, and a distinction between actions, words that come across as hateful or disrespectful or hypocritical, and actions.
actually having hate in your heart. Those are two separate things. And I, and I want to make sure I make that distinction. And when I say um, a defeater belief being, you know, those, the, the, the hypocritical Christian, here's, here's more of what I mean. Have you ever been driving down the road and the person who just cut you off has a great big sticker on the pass on the back of their car that says something about Christ and they like flipped you off because you know they're mad about the day okay if that's on the back of their car and yet they um, they engaged in something that was that came across as hateful rude and Hurtful absolutely behavior. the opposite of who Christ is supposed to be is that perceived as hypocritical by the world? Of course, right? So that's really what I mean. And I wanted to make that distinction, that there's a difference between um, actions that come across as, as, um, as, as hateful or disrespectful or rude, or, and, and that c becomes a, um, a view of, hi of hypocrisy for those who are Christians. Um, we talked about this a little bit, but postmodernist worldview do you want to dig into that a little bit more? Uh, let's see if we can do it in 20 seconds. So modernism was what came out of essentially um, the industrial industrialization out of World War II, where everything was science, everything was technology, everything was uh, logical, everything was pr progress, and everything was grounded in um, logic and faith and evidence. Postmodernism is the reaction to everything being logical, everything being evidence-based. So modernism was there is one, a truth. There is a single truth. That truth is um, uh, evident, and you can touch it, feel it, point to it, and it proves something. Postmodernism is relative truth. Your truth is true for you. My truth is true for me. Um, and that's how you land at what we've already uh, talked about earlier today. It, you know, all religions lead to heaven. All religions lead to God. That's your truth is true for you. My truth is true for me. And so one of the reasons that's an objection is that that's become a, a worldview of the younger generations. Uh, they've embraced this postmodern perspective of, you know, you are what you identify as. You are um, allowed to identify your own reality. You are allowed to set your own life rules and your own goals and your own priorities. There's no one true thing. And that flies in the face of biblical teachings in Christianity. But it, because it is so widely accepted, I failed to do this in 20 seconds, because it is so <laughs> widely accepted um, <laughs> in, in um, modern Western culture, it's uh, allowed to be a defeater belief because people go, well, that may be true for you, but it's just not true for me. And, and it actually doesn't even make sense even in our context because there is truth in our, in, in our world and in our context. Like, um, you're not allowed to murder somebody, right? You'll, you'll, you will go to jail. You will be prosecuted. You will have to, um, you know, serve time for that or, or whatever. But th the point is we all agree on certain truths. So how is all truth relative? Because if all truth was relative, then the person who went out and, and murdered 18 people, um, that's just the reality of their world, and it would be totally fine. Yeah. So it's absurd on the face of it. It's, it's absurd on the face of it. But it's become a position that people take. Yeah, Sean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So science in opposition of, of biblical truth, right? Um, it is, but it's still something that oh. people talk about. It's, it's not, it's not gone. Again. That's Say science in opposition. Thank you. Um, and uh, and it's, it's still something that people believe. They've just taken it now even to a new level, which is... Um, not just specifically science, but um, thought, intellectualism, in opposition to uh, biblical truth. Um, and, and so it's, it's cre saying that those two things are in opposition. Now, specifically, you're talking about creation versus evolution. Evolution has kind of um, not proven itself to be is valid. That, is that what you meant? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. So this is one of my favorite ones to engage people with. And um, the way I start the conversation is with an Oppenheimer quote. Um, Oppenheimer? No. Schrodinger quote. You guys know who? No. I got it wrong again. Heisenberg quote. You guys know who he <laughs> Heisenberg is? As in the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? I'm a scientist, by the way. So I love engaging scientists in this one. Okay. So do you guys know who Heisenberg was? Okay, as part of the Manhattan Project, he was one of the nuclear physicists that helped gave us the nuclear bomb. Okay, that's Heisenberg. Okay, so Heisenberg has another really famous quote. Okay, says the first gulp of the natural sciences will leave you as an atheist, but you find God waiting for you at the bottom of the glass. <laughs> and then where we start to go with that is talking to the post, the the uh, talking to the what do you call it, the scientist in opposition of God. Um, my experience is that the more and more that we unpack in the study of the natural sciences, the more and more we reveal the glory and nature of God. So I, I love engaging in that one. And I give you the punchline, and it's usually a two to three year long conversation to get there. Anybody else? I know, Denise, you had one back there. I just wanted to. Uh, uh-huh. Ah, dichotomy. Okay, so uh, just so that we have it on the recording as well. So this is what we consider the problem with hell. Um, and it's the fact that there is, um, from Christianity, there is a consequence to not choosing relationship with God. And if that's true, then it's not really a choice. Your, 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 your choice is between everlasting heaven and bliss or everlasting torment. Because how is that a choice? It's a false choice. It's, it's, and then so you reject the entire principle. Uh, also one that I struggled with in my atheism. Uh, absolutely. And, and we will spend time on that as well. Yeah. In this class. Yeah, Beth. Yeah, yeah. So, so person, personal suffering, including personal suffering, um, is is a is a really really difficult one. I have several people in my life who have suffered greatly. Um, our our daughter lost everybody who ever cared for her, um, and uh, does not understand how a good God could allow uh, so much death in her in her history in her life, um, and and so it it. You're right. It, now we're talking about a personal um, injustice, a personal experience. And when that is so um, terrible that it, it can become that barrier mm -hmm. to, to, knowing, to knowing God or to seeing that, that there's still a good God. Um, and how could there be if this was my personal experience? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and ultimately, yeah. That's true, that's true. And ultimately, um, it, it's not God's will. Um, God's will, his design, was not for death, destruction, um, and chaos. His design was for perfection and harmony and beauty. Um so it's, it's difficult because uh, it, it takes a bit to help people to understand that because of the effect of sin on the world, there is sin in the world. Um, and that's not God's fault. And yet he's still a good God. How does that all work out? So all of those, absolutely true. Sean? Mm 
Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, the question. The, yeah, you want to repeat the question? There's a lot in that question. Yes. So, when someone, when, when you're going through the apologetic process and you start to unpack the, the feeder beliefs that are um, the apparent reasons behind why someone is resistant to uh, coming to faith, um, how much of that is their genuine belief that, that that is their sticking point that's preventing them from coming to faith, and how much is that's a convenient excuse and something that they can point to and isn't the real reason uh, behind their resistance to um, conversion. And uh, that's and, and the real question is, should you take what they say at face value or should you, yeah. ta should you be digging into that root cause? Um, yeah, we are going to have to address that over the next 13 weeks, okay? Um, but, you know, part, part of that is they may not know what their real objection is. And a lot of times they'll latch on to something that conveniently go, yeah, there, that's a good reason that I can throw at you and make you go away with this thing that's making me very uncomfortable. Um, and so, you know, as Heather's, I don't know, I'm stealing your line. As Heather is uh, fond of saying, the presenting issue is rarely the issue, right? So the thing they come to you with as the problem is often not the real problem. But you're never going to get to the real problem until you start to address the surface presenting issues as well. Mm -hmm. And so as you come alongside that person and actually work through those issues with them, you'll never have the opportunity to get to what the real problem is. And that's where, <laughs> I'm jumping to the punchline, you're really partnering with the Holy Spirit. You're partnering with the Holy Spirit that... You know, you are systematically and logically and rationally and comprehensively going through and removing all of the obstacles and all of the objections while at the same time presenting this um, uh, attractive and truthful answer to existence and creation and life and meaning and faith and that the Holy Spirit will use all of that to work in their heart and work in their minds in order to break down their barriers. And then some one of those days, after five years of having coffee with this person, they're going to go, you know what, I just don't want to have to give up my 401k and my dreams of being able to retire on a boat in the Bahamas. <laughs> and you go, aha, <laughs> that was the real problem. Yeah. You've been sold this entire line from modern society that you get, if you work hard and delay for your whole life, you eventually get to live in bliss, right? Li living off of everything that you've earned, okay? And yet, now you get to start to actually really share the gospel. Do you know what heaven really is? You really want, you want to live, you want to live, you want to sacrifice all of this so that you get to live for this? Or do you want to use this in order to live for this? That, that Francis Chan demonstration of you know, the end of the rope versus the eternal rope that we tried to do here in the rope cut was, was too, too long and got all tangled. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so does that, answer you, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the answer to your question is yes and no. And I know that that's not a very satisfying answer, but... Um, what you said was very important. Whatever the presenting uh, objection is, you have to deal with that first. You can't just try to be the detective and get to the root cause. Because if they gave you what they, sa that what they say is their objection. And you ignore it. And you ignore it. Now you are. Irrelevant. Um, irrelevant. Not, and irrelevant wasn't the word I was going to choose. But you are. Um, it's about you and not about them. Psychological manipulation. Right? And it has to be genuine. There, there's, there's no shortcut to apologetics. There's no um, soundbite tagline that you can drop on someone that they go, oh, there, now I believe. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's a process. And, and, I, and I will say, and, and I don't want to open up a can of worms with what I'm about to say, um, but 
I know many in this room will have heard of the Romans Road, right? This is the walk through the book of Romans in order to show people that they are sinners, Christ died for them, and this is how, um, this is what God did. But here's the thing. You can't even get to that if they reject effectively the, yeah, if they reject, all of if the they reject scripture anyway. Yeah. So, so I, I hope that helps answer that a little bit is you, you have to go with what you're initially given, but you then also have to be a really good detective. And, and I said that there's no sound bite, there's no bumper sticker that will cause, that, that will be that, that silver bullet that brings people to faith. That being said, let me share a bumper sticker that was part of my transition. I was in my daily commute, I think this was sometime in 2006, 2007, and a bumper sticker on the car in front of me said, if you're living like there's no hell, you better be right. And that was, that was just one of the pieces, one of the moments, one of the realizations, one of the trail of breadcrumbs that was part of my walk to faith. You know, so can, can God, you know, God can and does use all kinds of things, okay? And so all of them will be cumulative as part of that case for faith. But there's not going to be any one thing, and it's going to be different because, he, you know why? Because people are unique. God is the God of creation, not duplication. If mm -hmm. we were all the same robots, we could all run the same program, and there wouldn't be a problem. We would all believe the same thing. But everybody is unique and has their own experiences. And so it's messy digging into what their objections are mm -hmm. and what's holding them back from faith because people are messy. People are complicated. So, all right. Um, okay, on. so questions, the goodness of God. We actually got into that a lot. Yes. Um, problem of evil. Yeah. Bad experiences with Christians and churches. Um, this is a very, very common one. Christopher gave you his example. That was a bad experience with a, a church and a Christian, a very well-meaning Christian, not a bad person, but somebody who didn't have enough confidence in their faith to be able to share it accurately with somebody else. Um, but what I, what I really want to kind of talk about for just a second is um, I was I was watching a podcast um, not the not too long ago and the person said this is this is one of the largest reasons that people either um, don't pursue Christ or walk away from church and that is a bad experience with a Christian or a church and here was something he said and I hadn't thought about it Christianity is the only place that people do that Religion is the only place that people do that. Let me give you an example. Mm. If you have a bad experience with a doctor, do you just never go to a doctor again? Do you give up on all of medicine? Or do you go to a different doctor? Okay. Um, if you have a bad car, do you never drive again? Or do you get a different car? If you have a bad experience at a restaurant and get a bad meal, do, do you, you never quit eat eating? again? <laughs> Here, that's my... That's what I'll do from now on. <laughs> right there. Now, so that's, that's the point that, that, that he was making is we, it, it, people apply that rule to Christianity, or church, religion. or religion, but they don't apply it anywhere else in their life. It, it is a great excuse, but I, I, I think that, that truly... Um, Culturally, societally, we've been given that permission. We've been given that permission. Um, and because if there's a postmodern view of the world, and that is that all truth is relative for you, then why do they have to? Why do they have to put up with that? Why do they have to invest? Because their truth is their truth, and so they just don't believe that's that truth, and they, they get to walk away. And ultimately... Um, you know, it comes down to a selfishness, which is the root of sin, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a desire to place self above God. And that is in every single one of us. That's how sin even came into this world. And that's how we participate in sin is because we put self above God. Every one of us does it. 
I think we're on slide four. I know. Yeah, we gotta get, keep okay, going. it's okay, it's okay. Religion is irrelevant. Um, that's another one. That's a uh, uh, an, an objection to apologetics. And there's also uh, a symptom of postmodernism. I'm doing just fine without religion in my life. Don't put that on me. And and when we talked about the fact that there that is a a cultural there are cultural differences, you go to another part of the world, and um, they could not possibly believe that they are looking for what is going to fill the hole in their heart because they don't have stuff to fill the hole in their heart. But we in our Western world yeah. have a whole lot of comfort and a whole lot of stuff and a whole lot of things that make us feel good in our estimation. And so why do we need God? Why, why do we need religion? I'm doing just fine. Thank you very much. I'm going to be a good person because I want to be a good person. And why do I need God to be a good person? I have a faith. I so have what a faith, or I'm very spiritual. I'm very spiritual. My, my spirituality is very personal to mm -hmm. me. Yeah. And, and I think where that truly comes from is that we are a culture that is perfectly okay with the soundbite. Um, and the soundbite, I have faith, that just sounds good. It's short. I don't have to get into it. And now I, I don't have to worry about I it. Don't, now I don't have to worry about it because... There you go. Um, and, and societally, culturally, secularly, we have been taught to embrace the soundbite. And, and I think that's where a lot of that comes from. Um, you know, we, we always joke about the fact that uh, marriage is a uh, choice over all of our uh, relationship. Um, why, why is it that, you know, this can be resolved on a TV show in 30 minutes when we've been working on this for, you know, 10 years. So then we think it's, you know, obviously God's not good because it couldn't be solved in 30 minutes. It's just a, it's, it's a, it's an effect of, uh, the culture and the society that we live in. And then the last one, suspicion of organized religion. I'm flashing on George Carlin skits where George Carlin lampoons religion. And one of his favorites is, you know, and God wants your money. God wants you to not have any fun. God wants you to not dance. God wants you to not enjoy the flavor of your food. You know, so it's that the suspicion of organized religion. Um, and, and some of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call us out. You know, um, we in the West tend to also be very suspicious of, you know, if we find out that someone is a follower of a particular religion, we automatically hold them suspect. So ju just like um, we are guilty of that same uh, 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 fear of, of the unknown, um, there are atheists that say, just because you're a Christian, now I'm suspicious. You just want me for your cult. You just want my money. You just want my kids. You just want something. And, and that, is, that is rooted in some truth that has happened in the world at some point, right? Because even those who claim Christianity may not be Christians. They may actually damage people. They may be in it for the money. They may be in it for your devotion and adoration. They're not in it for God. And here's where it really breaks down. It's because... Um, they're seeing that just like everybody else, just like everything else, Christians are in it for themselves. And that is not scriptural. That is not biblical. Everything in our Bible says you are to be second. You are to be the least. You are to humble yourself. You are to place others above you. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't work with, work a, lot with a lot of things. <laughs> it doesn't work with a lot of things, absolutely. It does. Because, because here in our culture, we have a belief that if we just had more, if we just made more, if we just had this, 
our lives would be solved. That's why retail therapy works. Mm -hmm. Until you get sick. Yeah. Carol? Yeah, and, and, and part of the reason why he just like got up and because that's something he used to say, faith is a crutch. Faith is a crutch. Faith is, is, is just what they have to have in order to get through their day because they're not capable of taking care of themselves and doing what they need to do, <laughs> right? That, I, 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 I have heard that 100%. I think everybody in this room has probably heard that from somebody. I may have heard it from him. Not but recently. It not wasn't recently. recently. Uh, and, and, this is, and this is what I love about God is he brought us together in a um, completely uh, non-faithful way, in a non-faithful... Um, our relationship was not based on faith. Or, yeah, I was trying to... Religion. I was trying to marketing that, and um, I didn't get that into a really nice, succinct way to say it uh, in a pretty way. But yes, our relationship was not based, based on faith. But because God had me in a place when I was young to be in a church that told me, if you're not questioning your faith, you're actually not faithful. And so because I was in a church that that was the belief, was if you're not questioning then you're not actually embracing your faith. You're not actually digging in. You don't even know what you believe or why you believe it. And that means you're not being faith-filled. So that being the case, that was my background. God brought us together in a non-faith context so that when Christopher had that, that he shared with me, I could come back and say, well, that was not my experience. So God uses whatever he has to use in order to grab people if you're willing to partner with him. We're still on slide four. I know. Okay. Okay. Why apologetics <laughs> for the believer? Um, and we've talked about a lot of this. It is important to know what we believe. And, and, I, and I just said that um, in my experience and in my context. Uh, I, I was told if you don't question, if you don't, like it is normal, it is natural for every single one of us to have doubts about something. And if you don't have doubts, that's probably, you're probably not being truthful with yourself. You're not thinking about it enough. Um, or you're not thinking about it enough. And it's okay to have doubts. And your job as a faithful follower of Christ is to investigate those doubts in order to get confirmation about what is true in Scripture. Um, so it's important to know what we believe. It's important to know the basics of um, the Bible. It's important to know why that, you know, um, that we believe that God created the world and everything in it, that we believe that sin entered the world, that we believe that Christ died in order to overcome that sin, that he rose again, and that he is our way to salvation um, and the only way to salvation. Those are the basic tenets of Christianity, right? It's now our job to dig further and deeper and to really understand why does, what is it that we actually believe? And then the second piece to that is why do we believe it? It's really important, it's vital to know why you believe what you believe. And it's okay that it is experiential for some of us. It is experiential and we can explain our experience with God over the course of time. But remember that God, uh, that Jesus said the, the, the greatest commandment was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So if you are not engaging your mind, then you are not engaging in the intellectual and you're missing a piece of how God wants us to interact and engage with him. It's a three-legged stool. You're missing one of the legs that doesn't stand. Uh, it contributes to our spiritual for, uh, formation. Do you want to take this one? Um, yeah, it's what I hinted at um, at the beginning. It's a, you know, the, the role that apologetics has played in uh, my growing faith and my maturing faith is that through exploring apologetics and digging into the academics and into the history,
history and in evidence. Um, it it um, helped my spirituality form and and um, flesh out, and uh, was really part of the foundation of my faith. And so, um, as you know, someone someone comes to faith and prays prays the prayer. Um, and that's that's the tip of the iceberg. It's really now they're just starting to explore this whole great wide world of God's truth, um, and exploring that leads to greater adoration, greater relationship, greater um, worship, greater um, engagement, and so it winds up becoming a more vibrant faith as you dig into it, and yes. all of that's part of it. Yep. Um, it enhances our faith. Oh yeah. Irre yeah, that's yeah. the relevance. Yeah, that the Bible is it was, that was, another was for yeah. them at that time. Um, they're <laughs> talking about things we just don't even have here today. Which um, is always a yes and. Which is always a yes <laughs> and. Because yeah. it's, it's culturally and contextually relevant at the time, but it's also culturally, contextually relevant from a kingdom principle in our time. And so you have to actually dig a little bit better, a little bit deeper, um, to make those connections, they they aren't as easy on the surface um, sometimes as they as they were maybe in the you know for those churches that were receiving Paul's letter or his letter at the t uh, whatever letter at the time it made sense because it was addressed to them in their context. But today in our context, we might look at that and go, I don't know what this means to me. And so you have to dig apart and really kind of understand what is the underlying kingdom principle that was being communicated through scripture, through that letter, through whatever God breathed into the person who communicated it. Because that will apply to you at some point. Absolutely. Just may not in the same way. Through apologetics. <laughs> and, and, and you know, one of the things you, that you talked about, you talked about all the things that it enhances your faith and that you engage with God and all of that. I, you were missing some of the emotional, and 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 some of that emotional was that's, you that's experience greater peace. That's the leg that I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, of the you stool, leg of experience the, stool. the joy and freedom of living under God's authority. You 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 start to um, feel more settled and okay with the context and your situation because you know and trust God because you understand his word. So it, it's all of those pieces. And so Chris talked about all, all of the ways that you can intellectually engage, but it's also emotional engagement. And, and we're going to get into something here in just a little bit and, and, um, and about... Actually, we can illustrate that with our next point. With the next point, is it enhances our faith and witness to others. So for some, for those who are more academically minded, it may be you know, they're, they're, they're um, inspired by a good apologist because they always have the right answer, right? That would be the academic side. But the, the other leg of that stool is that you may be inspired by someone's faith because they're never upset by the trials and tribulations of the world. You're like, how is it that you are always calm, cool, and collected, even though the world is falling apart around us? And you're like, well, because I have faith. Uh, you know, faith in what? You know, and you start to unpack it. And so it winds up being the witness of your life. You wind up having this true peace in your mm -hmm. life that is your reality that just doesn't make sense to people who don't have that same faith. And so that's, you know, that's kind of Heather's experience. It's, it's it, our, our, our example here is it, it enhances our faith and our witness to others. Witness, witness is a huge word. Witness could be answers to questions. Witness could also be example of your life. Okay? Witness could be you going on mission and sharing your faith with someone. Right? So there's three legs to the stool. We'll, we'll get there. And, and so, you know, all of the questions, all of the things that everybody brought up as those defeater beliefs, um, you know, when Denise had, it, it's not a choice, right? So you're, you're telling me I have a choice, but it's really not a choice. Um, how do you answer that question when you get it? Now, you can share all of your experience, and that's great, 
you can share all of the ways God has changed you, and that's great. But if you're then not engaging intellectually, you're not able to answer that question. It requires both. It requires all of that. Okay. And so that's why it enhances our faith and then our witness to others. Um, and ultimately, it's biblical. It is absolutely biblical. And, and this is um, a, a paraphrased quote from C.S. Lewis, because Christianity is both, and I said these two words were important, it's both true and satisfying. It's both true and satisfying. In Christianity, there is a place to stand and a story that satisfies the longing for both how things are, which is the truth, and how they ought to be, which is goodness and beauty. And in Christianity, and in Christianity alone, actually is where those two things meet. And we're really going to unpack that over the coming weeks. And so the second piece of this is why apologetics then for the non-believer. And if there were non-believers in this room, I don't think that there are. But if there were, this would be a great class for them. This would be a great class for non-believers. Because we're actually looking at it. It's not just emotional. It is not just intellectual. And it is not just scriptural. It is all of those and um, with a compelling reason that is logical, systematic, rational, and comprehensive. Okay, so why apologetics for the non-believer? Approaches conversation based on their current worldview. So to be a good apologist, you need to be an investigator. And, and figure out where the person is coming from. And so different people have different worldviews. If you're speaking to an Asian immigrant who recently relocated from uh, China, your approach and how to reach them is going to need to be very different than someone who's coming from South America or New York. So their worldview, what they've been steeped in, in their culture and their outlook on life, their priorities, their values, the government system and the laws and regulations, whether or not they fall under a Judeo-Christian ethic or you know, an East Eastern philosophy, all of, the, all of those um, factors play into how you approach someone. Mm -hmm. So you have to take their worldview into perspective. And so apologetics as a discipline meets other people where they're at. That you're, so one of the things that we didn't, I didn't necessarily say, but I probably hinted at is uh, in, in this study, in, in apologetics, we are coming at it without a Christian bias. Even though we are Christians, we're at we are addressing um, faith, the Bible, God, Jesus, eternity, in a it not steeped in Christian tradition. And it's the only way that for a non-believer, you're going to be able to make that connection. Otherwise, you just wind up spewing Christianese at them when you're literally speaking another language. You have to speak their language. Mm -hmm. So that might mean you have to learn their language. Um, it meets all three areas of human need, reason, conscience, and imagination. So it doesn't leave any pieces of the stool lacking for somebody. Now, you may come in and start talking to somebody because you connect with them on imagination, but if they then ask you a question based on reason and you don't have an answer for that, you're now stuck. Now, and, and I don't say this to, again, scare anybody, right? Um, the reason, there's a reason you're here and the re there's a reason you're taking this, this class and there's a reason we've dug into this. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to have every answer, um, but we're going to try to explore every answer that we can and then keep digging, keep going. Even after we're done in however many weeks it takes us, um, keep going, keep digging, engage in, in scripture, engage in study, engage in faith, engage in conversation. When you get that hard question, it is okay to tell that person, you know what, I don't know, but I will find out. I don't know how to answer that right now. Even better, That's okay. Let's find out together. Let's find out together. Yeah. And this kind of answers, goes back to Sean's original question, you know, is what if the presenting question isn't, you know, their, their real reason, the real cause? Because there's probably a little bit in each of this. Maybe it's 10%, 20%, and 70% you know, for uh, uh, reason, conscience, and imagination. And they may, they may lead 
with the one that isn't their major issue. They may not show you their true vulnerability, the one mm -hmm. that is really their sticking point. They'll give you one of the other ones that is less important <laughs> to them, a little but, safer. but it's a little safer for them to share. And, and so you have to be able to, with respect and with grace, address it with, with truth, but also grace, um, in order to be able to uh, earn the trust to be able to explore the real issue with them. Um, it applies rational and logical perspective. We've talked about that a lot. It does not assume a Christian worldview. Um, you know, us talking here and to each other, you talking to another Christian, um, you have the same foundation that you're working from. Somebody coming from a postmodernist worldview, not connected to this at all. And so you have to understand that they're coming from a different culture, different context. And um, apologetics doesn't assume the Christian worldview. Um, and then this Christianity and Christianity alone. This is uh, another paraphrase from C.S. Lewis. Affirms and honors reason without falling into a kind of calculating disembodied rationality as well as romance without falling into a kind of narcissistic and base sentimentality. So what, what this is saying is Christianity of all the worldviews is the only one that does this successfully. All the other faith systems, all the other religions, all of the other um, belief systems, all of them fail in some way. And so he's saying Christianity and Christianity alone both honors faith and reason without falling into all the pitfalls and honors that creativity and that romance and that love and that beauty without falling into all of the pitfalls. And I, I just want to say it one more time. This is when we say Christianity, not all Christians. I want to make that really clear because we are all human. We all make mistakes. We all say the wrong thing sometimes. Christians can do something that is wrong or say something that is wrong, but Christianity as its whole is both true and satisfying. Okay, so we, we talked, we said we were going to get to this. There are three pillars of apologetics, theological, academic, and missional. So first I want to, to talk about the theological side. So theological is the, the, the study of, the understanding of, the religion, the faith, what you believe in, why you believe in it, the theology, right? Um, and there's a couple of things that uh, apologetics specifically is understanding, unpacking, and really digging into. Um, and I'm just going to build the rest of these. Uh, the nature of common grace. And this is actually something that Paul does really, really well. Um, when he is in uh, Lystra, he goes out and he connects with them, not from a, from a, a, a Jewish worldview, which is where he, where he came from. That's what he was steeped in. Um, so he didn't come at, at them when he was talking to them about um, the law and the prophets and fulfillment of prophecy. He actually came at them with a common understanding of grace and a grace that is common to all people should they choose to accept God, should they choose to accept Christ. He, he came at it from the, the standpoint of, isn't God such a good God that he gives you the rain for your crops and that he provides this covering for you and you didn't even yet choose him, right? So that's where those people were at. He met them in that context. Um, the scope of common grace, how it applies to all who choose. Um, did you want to add? Okay. The nature of man and the um, effects of sin. So the nature of man as selfish, as, as self-preserving, as... Um, self-promoting, uh, that's all self and self and self and self and self. And then and how does that... made in the image of God. And yet made in the image of God. <laughs> loving, capable of generosity. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but still all under the effects of sin. But still all under the effects of sin. So um, the... It, it, thank you. The, the, um, the fact that we have a common 
uh, we have, actually have a common desire. We talked about it, that, that desire for truth, that desire for justice, uh, justice and the desire for beauty. Relationship a and, and that all comes as common across humanity because we're all made in the image of God, um, and yet we all fall under the effects of sin. Um, the nature of general revelation. What is general revelation? The fact that you can see God's fingerprints in the world and in creation and in the skies. So biblically, we're biblically. told, so here in our Christian worldview, we're told biblically that um, God is evident just in creation. The, the, the works of his hand are already evident. Um, and so there's no excuse for anybody not to know him because he's already evident. So that is, um, that there is general revelation to the world, uh, and then how do you build on that from, um, from an apologetics? And the propitiatory sacrifice of Christ on the cross, what does that mean? Why is it important? So theologically unpacking each one of these areas helps us know what we believe and why we believe it so that we can then share it. Next pillar. Next pi pillar is academic. This one's my favorite. I uh, know. <laughs> what? Theological. That's one of my, that's my jam. Academic. All Christopher. Go ahead. Uh, so, we'll put them all on the screen, please. Yep. So, um, we, there are multiple arguments for the existence of God. Uh, and it's usually, most of these arguments are using science, using observations about the universe, uh, creation, matter, um, using ontological arguments, using logical arguments about why God must exist. Um, prob uh, this is where we get into things like the problem of evil, the problem of hell. So we start to address a lot of those underlying defeater beliefs by going through and using logic and ration, uh, rational thinking and reason in order to unpack what the objection is and how a true perspective on the nature of God actually addresses and negates the defeater, defeater beliefs and answers them. Um, we get into the historicity of the Bible. A lot of people will say, well, yeah, that's just an ancient document and it's you know, made up and it's just like Homer's Iliad and it's just a piece of fiction and why is it relevant? And it's like, no, you know, there's actually quite a bit of evidence that the things that are in the Bible are documented accurately and real. Uh, and so, you know, is the Bible actually a document of historical accuracy or is it a work of fiction? So it addresses those issues. Um, the factuality of Christ's resurrection. Uh, that's a major objection in the modern world. We're like, okay, so there was this dude, Christ, but was he really cri crucified? Did he actually die? Did he actually raise from the dead? And, and did he actually perform, you know, these miracles? And so when you get it, dig into the, the evidence from 2,000 years ago um, about whether or not these things actually ha happened, there's this overwhelming avalanche of an answer based in tr verifiable history that these things really happened. And so the factuality of Christ's resurrection um, and then the uh, disciplines of evidence. Mm -hmm. So uh, we said this earlier, apologetics is a multidisciplinary endeavor, right? Meaning you use history, you use sociology, you use mathematics, you use science, you use archeology, span you use physics. What was it that, that uh, Heisenberg said? The first gulp of natural sciences leave you as an atheist, but God is waiting for you at the bottom of the glass. Meaning the more we use the tools that are given to us in our investigative techniques, and they get more sophisticated over time as we gain greater and greater mastery over technology, as we dig deeper, what we're finding is that the evidence that has been left for us in the world points more and more conclusively to the validity and truth of God as revealed to us through the Bible and through the story of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and resurrection on the cross. And it, people are like, well, surely as science and forensics gets better, we're going to discount and disprove everything about what Christians claim. And the exact opposite is happening. The as we get, are able to dig in in greater detail and with more sophistication and understanding, we're finding that the things that are recorded in the Bible are, are validated and found to be proven even more true than our previous understanding was. And so 
apologetics is multidisciplinary. And so um, that was one of the things that's in the case for Christ is he goes to all these different academics of all these different disciplines and he goes, yeah, but what about this? And they go, actually, when you really dig into it, it supports what the Bible says. And they mm-hmm. go, no. And then he goes to a mathematician. He goes, what's the chances? And the mathematician goes, actually, when you dig into it, it's you know beyond the possibility that all of these things could be true. And so you just go by going through all these different disciplines, you wind up revealing the nature of God that his, he gives you this overwhelmingly convincing body of evidence that when you put it all together it's this cumulative case that you can no longer refute the factuality of God and so that's the academic that's one of the goals of the academic side of apologetics and clearly as you can tell I'm kind of excited <laughs> about it. and and that's that's really kind of the traditional view of apologetics is this piece of it the academic side this one leg um, but this is only one leg of all three because there really is a third piece to this and that is the missional side of apologetics um, it is mm. it is evangelism in its uh, most effective form because it builds bridges. It builds bridges between those who do not believe um, from those who do believe. Um, And and it's it's actually um, approaching the audience um, to the gospel in view of their their current context. It's in view of, it's in light of their worldview. It's um, understanding where they're coming from. It's it's validating their um, their concerns and their current understanding, and then helping them to move to a different place from that. Mm-hmm. It, it understands their belief systems, their cultural views, and um, their emotional response patterns. So one of the things you said, <laughs> and we're cu- kind of coming back to it here, is do you start with what they, they tell you? Yes. That could be their belief system or a cultural value that they hold dear. And what might be revealed over time is their emotional responses um, and their emotional response patterns. And apologetics from a missionary standpoint, from a missional standpoint, from an evangelistic standpoint, is making sure that you have all of those pieces in order in order to then talk to somebody else and help grow. I know. we got nine minutes. Um, uh, in, it help, in order to help them reach the truth of uh, God and Christ's uh, sacrifice and eternity as it, as it stands. And then um, it uses, so from that missional perspective, it uses reason, um, what they call planks of reason, um, so building, building that bridge using those planks, uh, appeal to conscience and imagination and creativity. Uh, so all of those things are part of who God is, um, and it, often God gets put into a little box, um, and that's not, uh, we, it, it doesn't get unpacked for people in a way that feels satisfying, but apologetics in its truest form uh, will meet people in all of those places in all of those ways. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm wondering if we should stop here or if we, uh, if we want to kind of run through this in the next eight minutes. Well, we've actually covered a lot of it already. We've ar- we have covered um, a lot of it. I, I do want to talk about the um, bibli- bi- a biblical apologetic attitude because this kind of speaks to uh, Tina's concern and adre- uh, objections earlier. Is you know we have to be careful about what we say and how we approach people um, bec- uh, because we can wi- we can wind up driving people away. We can be a stumbling block for people who coming to faith. I can't hardly read that. Yeah, it's a it's First Peter three fifteen. But in your oh, hearts, right. honor Christ so the Lord our, is holy. Our anchor verse. So yep. it's it's uh, Peter's um, exhortation to his followers that yes, you need to be able to uh, answer when people say, "Why do you believe what you believe?" You need to be able to answer them with truth, but. The critical part here is do so in a way that you don't wind up driving them away from the faith. So do so with gentleness and respect. And so um, there's this this caution that you have to be careful. Um, and, and so it's, I like the way he says it. Peter also instructed us to engage with a proper attitude toward the unbelievers with whom we're speaking. 
and about the Lord about whom we are speaking. So you have this dual priority that you need to honor God with the, with the truth, but you also need to respect the person that you're talking to, not talking down to them, not running over them, not just shooting um, fiery darts of truth at them because they, you're looking to burn them and prove yourself so smart and witty and all-knowing and knowledgeable. So the attitude is very important. And, and ultimately, one of the things I wanted to pull out of this is so often um, we pull a piece of that piece a piece of that scripture as opposed to the entire scripture. We either talk about making sure that you have a defense for your faith, a reasoned, rational defense for your faith, or we focus on the fact that you need to be gentle and respectful in the way that you do it. And what we need to remember as part of this class is it is both. Both of those are are, are our command within this piece of scripture. We need to understand what we believe, why we believe it, and be able to uh, communicate that to people in a way that they will understand. And we also need to do that in a way that does not drive a wedge between us and the other person. John? Yeah. No, <laughs> a a absolutely. It's okay to use that idiom. It's okay. It's the long game. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, and, and I think there's two ways to say that. Um, you can win a battle but lose the war, right? And so that could be uh, something that's happening. When you're so invested in being right. You can be right in everything you're saying and be wrong at the top of your voice. And so those are, uh, those are things that we need to make sure that when we approach apologetics that we do it with the right attitude. And, and this from John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So it, it's one of our favorite things to say. We need to, we need to speak truth with grace. So we need to be both reasoned and factual and rational and logical and yet do so in a way that does not drive a wedge, that is respectful, that is gentle with those that you're communicating with. Um, okay. It's okay yeah, for us to... Uh, run through these because yeah. we've already covered it all. So apologetic approaches, there's positive apologetics and there's negative apologetics. Positive apologetics is what we've been talking about, meeting people where they're at, building bridges, not alienating people, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a process that um, is ultimately showing them the truth of the gospel by highlighting the joy, highlighting the validity, highlighting the love, um, and then the counteractive approach is negative apologetics, um, which is, um, it, it can be effective and it can be appropriate at times, but a lot of times negative apologetics goes on the attack um, and goes to invalidate their worldview, invalidate um, their religion or belief system by pointing out logical fallacies or, or, tr or, or uh, truths that aren't true. Um, and, and the best way I you. have to say between a positive and negative, positive apologetics is us together, and negative apologetics is me versus you. Now, can you have a, a positive outcome of a me versus you? Possible. Sure, it's possible with the right person, but especially in our Western culture, where everything is about me versus you, us versus them, my belief versus your belief, my, my, what I hold as, as true and what you hold as true, everything is built on division and setting up your own little camp. And so because of that, um, oftentimes somebody is coming into the discussion 
And their first question is to find out, are you, on, are, are you on their team or are you opposed to their team? Whatever the question Whatever is. Whatever the question is. A lot of times is. it's irrelevant. It's more your approach that gives them the answer and it causes them to either engage or disengage. Mm -hmm. So better to be bridge builder. Move on. Okay, so uh, the, the, the uh, unpacking pause it and we're almost done. Yeah, we actually talked about We actually talked bridges. about a lot of this. Um, building bridges is we, we have that long game, that end goal of, of helping people to see the gospel, but it's meeting people where they are at. We understand that people are coming from not our same understanding and context, um, that you do have to be that detective, learn about the other person. Um, the goal is identifying the connection point, identifying that starting point. Where are they at? And then how can you move them through, which means you need to have a lot of arrows in your quiver. You need to have a lot of understanding. Um, and then you need to determine what the most effective bridges will be. And this sounds so manipulative when I say it this way, but it's not. It, it, it's actually Investing. designed in, in order to meet that other person exactly where they are and not to force your perspective on them but to help them along a journey. Um, and this is something that we just wanted to, to share with you. This is called the angle scale. And it goes from, you know, negative 10, negative 10, which is they have no framework of God at all, all the way down through. They are effectively sharing faith and life. And it, one of the first things as you're in this missional approach to apologetics with a specific person is where are they on the scale? Because if they have no framework for God and you start talking about scripture, they are not going to be connected to what you are talking about. And if they are just, you know, they're, they're, they've got some evaluation of their decision of repentance, so they're, they're at a plus one, how do you then t help them to take the next steps and understand things even better? And ultimately, I wanted to read this. Um, the purpose of apologetics is to be rightly related to reality. What does that actually mean? That we have the right perspective on God and what he has created and that our goal overall in this study is to bring together the considerations related to the nature and task of apologetics. So what is it and what are we supposed to do with it in such a way that a person, as a whole person, mind, heart, and soul, um, with the help of the Holy Spirit, that is absolutely true, see and believe that Christianity is both true and satisfying. And you'll, you'll, these will be in your um, notes, and these are kind of questions that if we had had time, we'd have gone over them. But um, just think about it over the coming week. So the questions are, which of the three pillars of apologetics speaks to you most and why, which may help you identify one where you're going to get passionate about apologetics and two where you need to invest a little bit more into that area of apologetics because it's not your bread and butter. Um, what areas of apologetics are most relevant to your faith and to the other people in your lives? Have you ever encountered negative apologetics, meaning that biblical gunslinger, and how did that feel for you so that you understand how you want to uh, love your neighbor? Uh, and then think of someone you know that is a non-believer. And, and here's where you sh I want you to start doing some investigative work. What reasons do you think are keeping them from belief in God? And then the question beyond that, how do you know? Have you had that conversation? Have you started to investigate and dig deeply? And then um, I always like to include a prayer. And this is what I would love for everybody to take home and just be praying every day of this coming week. Um, and it's this, and we'll close with this prayer. And then Chris and I will be around. We can um, answer any questions. This is just the start. <laughs> This is just the start. This is just what is apologetics and why do we use it? Um, so this is our prayer, and we're going to um, share this tonight uh, and then invite you to pray this over the coming week. If you'll join me in prayer. Thank you, God, for understanding me as a whole person, heart, mind, and soul. Help me engage in your word and experience the presence of your Holy Spirit Use me as your hands and feet in the world to reach those who need you but don't know you yet. Please use this study to strengthen my faith and equip me to share the gospel confidently with truth and grace. Amen.
Okay, thank you guys so much. We will be back here next week. Um, and if anybody wants a, um, a copy of the slides in a bigger print, I can do that real quickly. Um, and uh, there's, there's a couple more copies, but if you want a big print, I will make a big print right now. Since it's 8 o'clock, we want to let you go home. We're going to go ahead and stop the recording. But if there were any questions or uh, anyone wanted to stick around and discuss, we will not leave until you are done. Yep. And we're going to send the PDF. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's really. It, <laughs> I oh, we do, and we have to we have to put it together ourselves.